It is Friday, 6.30-2017. It is 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So you know what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And as usual, I have absolutely no idea where to take us today. I'm sure it'll I'm sure it'll meet itself out. I've got at least a half dozen or so tabs open on the old browser, and the Twitter feed never seems to fail us when we get into a real pinch, and of course there's always Google on top of that. A lot of interesting things happening this week. A little bit of sideways movement as far as uh, as far as Bitcoin is concerned. Um, and there's still the kerfuffle about the fucking Segwit2x and the UASF and all that other bullshit. I don't know, personally, I, I really wish that shit would just die. You know, I, I really wish that the people that are behind UASF 148 would just forget about it. You know? But it seems like they're going to try and make us face that that issue straight on just to see what will happen. It's kind of a stupid proposition when you really think about it. It's like, let's risk a $100 billion industry just to, just to just fucking see. You know, just, you know, try it out. Now, you know, it's, it's not like we don't have more than enough options available that already have segregated witness. Litecoin has it, for instance. And as far as I can tell, you don't even need it for things like Ripple um, or even if, I don't know if Ethereum needs it or not. I don't think it does. Um, <clears throat> point being that we've seen how this, this happens. We, we've seen how this, how, how this plays out. What happens is the stupid people that think that the community is everything and the users are everything and they should be able to determine what code other people run on their computers. Um, they're going to fork, you know, they're going to get their little fork and then they're going to lose about 60 to 70% of the network. And they're going to lose 60% right up front. But then they're going to lose the other seven, the other like 10, 15% shortly thereafter. Because shortly thereafter, those people will figure out, no, this fucking Segwit bullshit is a fucking boondoggle and we don't want anything to do with it. And so we're just going to go ahead and start mining regular Bitcoin without this bullshit and maybe get a 10, 10 megabyte block increase in there. I'm really hoping that that's the way it goes. You know, that the idea that there's any any entity that is directing the direction of Bitcoin, I, I I have yet to see evidence of that, folks. I mean, initially we tried things like the Bitcoin Foundation and, you know, that had an interesting but very short run before it lost credibility. And it, it always comes down to the same thing, is that this a political group, and I say political because... The changes that they're proposing aren't necessarily what I would consider to be upgrades to Bitcoin, but they do change the power dynamic of Bitcoin. You know, despite the fact that it's worked relatively well for the last eight years, you know, we got to change it because the banks can't use it as is, because they can't cheat on the blockchain or any of that other bullshit. And really, when I when I look at the look at segregated witness and lightning network. I just see possibilities arising that that currently don't exist in Bitcoin for significant abuse of the of the trust of everybody using Bitcoin, you know, and and, that, and that's just my my perspective. Of course, I I really expect that all of you will do exactly as you feel, and that's that I think is the more important thing about Bitcoin is that we can do that. That we can say, you know, this isn't exactly the. I I, I want to support a, a a BIP that you know these other guys don't want to support. So I'm going to go ahead and flag support for it. You know, we, we really need that in in Bitcoin, and I I'm happy that there are people that you know they're looking at the at the passion of the segregated witness people, and they they see some sort of merit in their arguments and they say, yeah, you know, that, that sounds like a good way to go. I'm going to go ahead and flag support for it. I mean, I think that's cool. That's, that's how the community is supposed to work. What I, what I object to is changes in the code that will 
bar people from having that that level of freedom and we've seen it before in in uh, bitcoin but not to not to an incredible extent it seems like the the plurality of consensus kind of has negated a lot of the the worst situations we could have gotten in, ourselves into like uh for one thing i think if if we had gone ahead maybe even like a year ago with segregated witness on Bitcoin, that the ICO crappening would be happening on Bitcoin instead. That's just my feeling. But, <clears throat> I mean, like, I, I've talked about this before on this show, where the the ICOs, the, the proposals, we've read them on this show. I read the one for Oracle, and I damn near threw up in my mouth. You know, I mean... There, there's so many fucking question marks and so many pot- uh, potents for abuse in that thing that I, I don't even want to touch it, man. Or, or bank or okay, these things have presented as standard altcoins where you start up your IC, uh, IRC channel, you start up your your Twitter channel or your Twitter account, your Facebook account, your Instagram account, and all your accounts. And you try and build a presence for your coin. That that's if they had done that, that they never would have been able to generate a significant community because the community would have taken one look at it and said, "Oh, this is a fucking scam coin." Because literally, the the paperwork it reads like a lot of the fucking scam coins that I was reading back in 2013, 2014 when that shit started. It's like, come on, man. You guys don't even have a fucking office. You have a proposed office space or, or a proposed locality where you will be based when you get a base. I mean, come on. That's it's a fucking joke. You know, most of them don't even have code. Or a lot of them don't even have code. They have, like, a, a presentation for how the thing is supposed to actually operate and what, what use case it's supposed to occupy, but... That's about it. And like I said, these things wouldn't have even passed the smell test, the, the scam coin smell test back in 2014. You take one look at it and you'd be like, you're based where? Liechtenstein? Gosh, that's in nobody's extradition dur- jurisdiction. So, no, that's probably not a good idea. <sighs> but, you know, we, we let it slide because it says ICO on the end. And supposedly that's the... That's the the special little tag that you can put on it that gives it some sort of stank of legitimacy because I guess so supposedly it's going to be supported by Ethereum. Well, what happens when Ethereum takes a significant crap for a significant period of time? Then your fucking ICO that was backed by Ethereum is now worthless. And we we've seen repeatedly where there have been significant dumps of ethereum shortly after the the uh, ico period closes on some of these projects so i mean really you know what are you trying to tell me you know you need boats and hose and you don't have money i mean that that's pretty much what it sounds like anyway because of our directionlessness we're just going to go ahead and uh, throw down a little bit of slip not for our first dance a little spelled incorrectly here on coin metal and that was Push Monkey with Lefty. And of course, I gotta adjust volumes a little bit because I changed position. Yeah, Jiu Jitsu's been kicking my ass lately, folks. Been kicking my ass hard. Yeah, I, um, the other day I was, uh, I was rolling with this very, very large gentleman. Uh, he, was, he had me by at least a foot. And maybe maybe twenty or thirty pounds. I'm not sure. Anyway, so I'm I'm trying to take this guy on, and uh, we were playing pass keep, and I was uh, I was trying to get him in my guard. He, I was trying to escape his guard and get him into my guard, and uh, from side control. For those of you who actually know what that is. Anyway, I managed to wrangle him around and sit up. And I just got my leg, one leg over him, and he thought to roll away from the leg that I got down, right? Well, this put me in position to fully mount him. 
But the thing was is that I brought my heel down rather than tucking my toes or, you know, tucking my my knee and just trying to, like, cup around his buttock as he slammed over. And so my, my heel contacted and, like, jacked up my knee a little bit. And so I've been, like, nursing it. And today I went into class anyway. And, uh, you know, it felt fine all day, you know. I, I've been stretching it. I've been icing it. You know, I've been lightly working it. And uh, just just trying not to uh, push it too hard, you know. And uh, so, for the most part, I was doing fine until about forty minutes through the uh, through the uh, class. And uh, I just I I hit it a little too hard or something. It was like okay, gotta gotta back off. Can't roll anymore for this this class. And uh, just take a step back go back to icing stretching working it out and you know i'm just not ready for it yet that's all and i i hate that i mean it was i I had an opportunity to talk to coach aaron while i was convalescing watching all my classmates tear one another apart and uh you know I i was telling him it's like it's worse than being a fat kid in a candy store not being able to eat anything it's like it's it's right there. There's a guy that wants to roll, and and I could roll with him, but I'm gonna have to be telling him the whole time. Oh, watch my knee! Oh, oh no, ow! You know, I mean, because like, dude, my elbows are messed up, my my knees messed up. I, it, it's time to just slow the roll turbo, you know. And so I mean, you know, if we were talking about like flow rolling or or something like that, I could maybe do that. But I mean, even then, I, I'm just. I'm keeping it to like warm ups and and uh, and just doing positions and stuff for for the class, but I'm not I'm not doing sparring or, or rolling or anything like that for right now. I mean, my body's telling me it's it, it's time to recover, and I've been averaging three classes a week for months on end now, and it's only now started to catch up with me, you know, and it's it. Honestly, I think it's because I've been doing an awful lot of yard work in, in addition to going in and, and doing jiu-jitsu. You know, it's like I go and I do yard work for about six or seven hours in the blazing sun, and then I go to jiu-jitsu and get my ass kicked for a couple hours <laughs> or for an hour or so. <clears throat> but anyway, enough about me and jiu-jitsu. There's more than enough exciting stuff going on here in crypto and let's see here I caught this one and uh, I've suspected for a while now that the people that really want segregated witness are doing a multi multi front attack you know they're they're doing this UASF bullshit Um, but on top of that I suspected that there were some issues going on that were causing the uh, the uh, mempool to clog up, and there was there was some suggestion of spamming the network, and um, so I'm like wondering if the two part if the party that won segregated witness would spam the network in order to give the network the impression that they need to quote unquote scale to match this additional load and <laughs> and that you know their their option is the only way out of this conundrum you know I, I just I think that's bullshit you know if if your software appeals to enough people if the advantages that the that the uh, proposal you know if people expect that it will confer to them enough value to use your your proposal, then they'll adopt it. If they don't, the answer isn't to like try and coerce them because that's that's really not how this thing is supposed to work. I mean, it, to some extent, it is. It's, it's competition and all that, but I don't know. I just I think it's a disingenuous kind of action. You know, I mean, we're not really looking out for everybody when we're talking about threats. And we're talking about coercion. You know, I mean, clearly, if you have to coerce somebody, then there's no real need 
to do the thing that you want them to do. If there were a need to do it, you wouldn't have to coerce them. It would be plainly clear to them that the option you're providing is, in fact, the best way out. But it's kind of clear after two years, don't you think, of uh, the majority of the network saying no. Yeah, You would think that no means no at some point. You know, the, the no, no, no. I mean, come on now. I mean, if that if that were a date, that that would be coercion in some states, you know. <clears throat> anyway, on to an article, and this one here is on uh, Coin Telegraph, and it was written by Mr. Joseph Young. Clearly, he has a penis. He has a little picture of himself here. Right. I'm I'm assuming that's a he. It looks like a he. Yeah. I don't know, I'm not close enough to the monitor. I have to actually sit away from it to stretch my leg out here. Yeah? So anyway, Bitcoin transaction fees significantly decrease. Charlie Shrem pays 25 cent fee. Over the past few weeks, the size of the Bitcoin mempool, the holding area for unconfirmed transactions waiting to be picked up by miners, significantly decreased by around 90%. As a result, Bitcoin fees significantly declined and the recommended Bitcoin transaction fee calculated by Bitcoin fee estimators integrated widely utilized wallet platforms such as blockchain substantially dropped. Now fees below $1 have become sufficient to obtain first confirmation, com confirmation within 10 minutes. In fact, Blockchain's newly deployed Bitcoin fee estimator, which has received praise from the community for utilizing a Satoshi's per byte basis to establish recommended fees for users, more accurately has been recommending a 19 cent fee for regular transactions with an estimated confirmation time of one hour. On June 29th, Bitcoin Pioneer and cryptocurrency wallet, wallet platform operator Jax, COO Charlie Shrem, revealed that a personal $2,000 Bitcoin transaction was confirmed within the, within the first six minutes with a $0.25 cent fee. Why did fees become cheaper? In late June, the size of Bitcoin mempool reached an all-time high of around 120 gigabytes. The large pool of unconfirmed transactions within the network led to the congestion of the entire Bitcoin blockchain and the delay of transactions that had trans had attached appropriate and propor proportional fees. For over a month from May 1st to June 15th, the Bitcoin mempool remained unreasonably large as the mempool failed to clear transactions during the weekend. Previously, the Bitcoin mempool had always cleared the majority of, of its unconfirmed transactions during the weekend when substantially fewer transactions were being settled on the Bitcoin blockchain. However, the failure to clear transactions during relative, in, relatively inactive periods led the Bitcoin mempool to expand and store even more transactions. Abruptly, the size of the mempool decreased within a matter of weeks and within 21 days, starting early June, the size of the mempool declined from 120 gigabytes to 20 gigabytes. On May 12th, Cointelegraph reported that the activation of a viable scaling solution is urgently needed due to the abnormally large size of the Bitcoin mempool. Several an analysis, <laughs> analysts, including Bitcoin researcher Ben Barrett, suggested the sudden decline in the size of the Bitcoin mempool is a direct result of the termination of network spam and that because the activation of segregated witness is getting closer, spam transactions have stopped targeting the Bitcoin blockchain. What a co fucking coincidence. Well, <clears throat> think about it this way, kids. <laughs> the There's only so much hashing power out there. So, imagine you... Or computing power, whatever. So... 
imagine that the people that have been trying to do UASF have been mounting up a lot of computing power, dedicating it to putting out bum transactions and, and flooding the mempool. Alright. And now they, they need the the same computing power now to signal for UASF-148. So they're shutting down the their spamming and converting over to signaling for UASF-148. How convenient, huh? Gosh, it's almost like bankers have started mining. <laughs> so yeah, you know, that's the the political angle of it. And, and really, that's that's that statement I made about bankers. I, I really think that's the case. When you when you trace down like the kind of effects that that relying on lightning node networks for for your transmission of your your uh, transactions to the Bitcoin blockchain uh, that that creates a man in the middle, you know. And we've talked before about man in the middle attacks. But it bakes in to the mining process a man in the middle, you know, a person to deal with all that segregated witness data. Anyway, back to the Librato, as it were. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, that that um, that transaction scaling thing that that's a good option. You know, I mean, clearly it's it's having positive effects. I mean, a 19 cent transaction fee. That puts us back in competition for all that fucking visa traffic now, doesn't it? You know, and, and somebody brought up visa as, you know, we're, we're supposed to be competing with visa. Who signed up to Bitcoin to compete with visa? I, I, I'm sure you don't see that person in the mirror. If you do, then I, I don't know why you're here. Because... Competi- competing with them is easy enough if you just stick to what Bitcoin does. If you can, if you can manage a confirmation in ten minutes, you're you are already three days ahead of the banks. And turning turning Bitcoin into a, a thing that has a a, a potential eight day or longer span of between uh, transaction clearance or transmission and clearance uh i don't know I, I find that fucking unreasonable and for those of you who are shaking your head wondering what i'm talking about right now in the uh ln white paper they talk about having a a uh, a payment channel open for up to a thousand blocks well when you when you do the math on that it works out to be roughly eight days so, you know, basically, uh, imagine if if the bank were the quote-unquote user or lightning node operator. You know, they have a series of banks out there and they're all connected to their own blockchain network and they're all doing their own, their own mutable slash immutable thing. But they're, they're the point between you doing a transaction to the to clear onto the uh, the uh, Bitcoin network, and you don't really have a choice in the matter, because that series of banks, they can afford to pay way bigger transaction fees than you can, and it's a, it's kind of the same principle behind uh, insurance companies and healthcare. See, I I think that that health insurance is a scam, and it's basically a scam that's meant to inflate the cost of health care quote unquote care. I mean and when you when you look at the uh, the marketplace for for medical care equipment that that is marketed to to uh, medical establishments, you know, it, uh, it, it's just incredible like and and even worse is is the more specialized it gets. You know, I mean if you're if you're like a special foot surgeon or some shit like that, the the equipment that you buy is going to have some extraordinary premium on it, and you'll pay it because then you can justify the cost against 
against the uh, bill that you give to the insurance company and the insurance company will pay it because they can afford to get they they can afford to pay it because of course they've got way more healthy customers than sick customers at any one time that are paying them so they don't have to you know they're not paying for a medical thing for everybody every day you know but they they have enough healthy customers to pay off the bills of their unhealthy customers and they accumulate a large enough pool of money that if I'm selling like surgical tubing it doesn't matter that I went and got it to the fucking uh, at the hardware store and I'm marketing it now to a hospital they're going to fucking pay whatever premium I want to put on it and they'll do it because I'm willing to supply it you know and, and I'm sure that I could go down to the fucking hardware store and get surgical tubing there and then go to one of these hospitals and be able to make a significant profit just dealing them in the back door saying hey you know uh, you know if I paid five bucks for a spool turn it around for 20 okay give me a case give me two cases because <laughs> it's gonna be cheaper than their their legitimate certified dealer you know, and it's going to serve the same purpose. And I think that's the mistake that a lot of these people that are that are pumping segregated witness, they're not really looking that far down the line. You know, they, they just look at their little scaling project that they've been working on that they think, oh, we need segregated witness in order to scale this thing on top of Bitcoin. Well, you know what, dude? Bitcoin wasn't designed to scale your bullshit on top of. If, you're, if your bullshit is worthwhile... You can find a fucking market for it. You don't need to coattail it onto Bitcoin. And it's probably less profitable for you if you do. I, it just it defies my imagination sometimes why people aren't like... I mean, I see some of it with the bigger companies and the banks and shit where they're taking this technology and they're trying to incorporate it in but within their own structure. Okay, within their own little corporate structure and seeing what things that they can replace internally. And I think that's that's exactly how this technology should be used on that level. Now, when you're trying to expand it out to your customers, I think that's... I, don't, I, don't, I think of this more like a... Uh, a thing that if it's going to be your customers that are that are participating in it that they actually be participating in it you know that they be providing you with with processing power and electricity and bandwidth on their own and you be compensating them for it but instead what what turns out is that their contribution is is you know their their sleep habits their shopping habits their clicking habits you know, we, we need to document all that shit and monetize that shit, man, because that's really important. Give me a fucking break. That, that's, that is not the, the best use of what we call the internet. I mean, it, it seems really interesting, probably produces a lot of wonderful looking graphs, but it deviates from the greater things that we could be doing with it. You know, I mean, what what's the necessity for for what we call education and schools and whatnot in an age where we can have access to information 24-7, including classes. We don't have to be present at any time in any classroom to be learning a lesson from one of them. You know, if we, if we had a, a shred of compassion... We'd be looking to do things like give live feeds of teachers and have us have an associated QR address for that person, for that teacher. And you'd be able to tune into that class from anywhere on planet Earth and learn about whatever it is they are teaching. So, you know, if they're teaching... You know, something about computer science, or maybe mathematics, or biology, or history. We're not limited now 
to just one perspective. It's no longer, history is no longer just one perspective. We see it from both sides now. We can see it from both sides. We could be learning history. I, I could be learning history from somebody in the fucking Philippines and the, the whole Philippine War would have an entirely different meaning. But it would be that much more instructive about how humans operate and how we can operate better. You know, I think that's... That, but anyway, back to the QR code thing. Like, maybe if you had some money that you could pay this person. Then you scan it and say, oh, you know what, this is worth three bucks for me today. This is a positive use of three hours of my time. I learned a great deal. Three bucks. Okay, well, you know, maybe you're not the only one tuning in. Maybe there's 100,000 fucking people tuning into that class that day. And maybe not, maybe 10, 15% of them could actually afford to pay something. But I guarantee you that the planet can afford to pay that teacher a hell of a lot more per class than that fucking school, than any rich motherfucker that comes along and says, hey, I want to hire you to do, nah, nah. The guy could be teaching this shit from his home. You know, something like Khan Academy with the addition, of course, of QR codes. And, more importantly, if it's if they bother to fucking record the thing, they can post it up on YouTube with the QR code associated that could then be scanned by somebody 10 years from now. And maybe they only got 15 cents worth out of, out of it for the three, three hours. But you know what? You're still earning money from a class you taught 10 years ago to maybe 20 people live, but, you know, 20 million in that 10-year period. You know, I, I think that those kind of time scale things, pe- people are only looking at them in strategic ways to how we're going to m- balance our, our market to where we can make the most money and shit. They're not really thinking about he- the kind of effects that these technologies could be having on a on a broader scale. I mean, I'm sure somebody's doing it and there's little pockets of it here and there. But I mean, something like a Facebook, okay, where you could go and you can learn and intera- interact with other people that are on there and it's not being used to harvest your fucking ideas for you while from you while there's still fucking little memes popping around in your dome. And, and then fucking monetize behind your back without benefiting you at all, you know? I mean, like, we, we know that that's how Facebook is used, you know, that they, any, like, little original thought that you might have, it gets assimilated like it's, like it's some new fucking culture to the board, you know? And it, it gets incorporated into Facebook's own uniqueness, <laughs> <laughs> I swear, I, I uh, commented on something that uh, Christoph Atlas had posted, and it it was a, a group of pictures of Mr. Mark Zuckerberg, Mr. Multi-Billionaire Mark Zuckerberg, um, posed in places that people that are are worth maybe like five to ten thousand dollars <laughs> are, are are lingering about, and so the, this guy I don't know what it is about Mark Zuckerberg, there, but even in still frame pictures, there's something about his expressions that are like five percent off. You know, he's not he's like a a human that doesn't quite pass the the uncanny valley kind of thing, and so I commented on on this thing that that it was posted and I I said, you know, I can almost hear the code, (laughs) you know, (laughs) rotate head, you know, 0.25 degrees, nod, blink, construct, construct parallel anecdote, deploy. (laughs) I mean, really, it's like, he's like just two shades short of data, you know, (laughs) he's like, he's got just enough melanin in his skin that he doesn't quite pass as an android. (laughs) But, I mean, you know, that's that's just my perspective. And, you know, maybe they're catching him at awkward angles. Maybe it's like, maybe it's one of those things like 
at the DMV where no matter what what you try to to look like for the camera I mean you can you can put your makeup on if you're a girl or you know you can you can do your hair right up if you're a guy or whatever no matter what it is the DMV will always catch you looking like you just smoked the biggest fucking fatty ever and then take a picture of you maybe that's what's going on with with Zuckerberg is like you know, out of like eight billion frames of, of pictures that they catch him in, like they they pick the one or two where he looks the most like an android. <laughs> and it's like I'm sure that like any one of us, if they were to catch that many frames of photos of us, that like they would catch us in that frame where we don't quite look human. We look still a little bit robot, and those are the ones that they publish of Mark Zuckerberg. You know, and it's like. He's perpetually being caught in these, in like over one, one out of every 100,000 frames of the guy. You know, it's like that. Oh, that's the one. Yeah, that's the one that makes him look like a robot. We're going to use that one. <laughs> you know, the light was just right. You know, it's it's kind of diffuse off of his head. It's not quite refracting the same way as it would off of a human's head in under normal circumstances or normal lighting. Whatever. Point being that. Or, or maybe they're like photoshopping it, you know, they're like, oh, let's, you know, take a little bit of color out of his irises, you know, make him look a little more like data. <laughs> but I, I don't know what it is. There's just something about the dude. Every picture that I see him in, he, he doesn't quite look human. He looks like something that was created in Area 51 and like is being passed off as a human being. <sighs> Sorry, Mark. That's just how I feel, man. Anywho... Let's go ahead and kick back down into some music. And I've been dying to play some fucking Pantera. And, uh, hell yeah. Cowboys from Hell. Here on Coin Metal. And that was Nine Inch Nails with Closer. Oh, I pity the children that never got to hear that on the radio. Even the edited version. Oh, man, I'm so everywhere at once and like got like some conversation going on twitter and i'm in the the uh radio crypto chat room as well although some people have some dude came in and left and i don't know some people are popping in and out of there so you know and i'm also in the irc chat room uh, like i said i'm just everywhere <sighs> anyway, where the hell were we going on the other side of that? I haven't the slightest clue. But we do have plenty of tabs to select from here. And uh, <sighs> There was one thing I wanted to cover here. I thought this looked kind of interesting. Um, this one is on Altcoin Today, June 30th, uh, 2017. A $770 million India po- Indian Ponzi scam has Bollywood celebs and Bitcoin. <clears throat> An alleged 500 crore, approximately $772 million cash for clicks Ponzi scam in India is complete with Bollywood celebrity endorsements and payouts in Bitcoin. According to local reports, the Central Bureau of Investigation, India's primary law enforcement intelligence agency, has begun an investigation into an alleged Ponzi scheme that promised money for clicking on online advertisements. For context, the case is centered around a new private startup called Webwork Trade Links, and that launched in September last year with the paid up cash for stock capital of a relatively measly uh, one locked about $1,500. Four months later, the company's revenue had grown to 260 crores, nearly $400 million, entirely from investors' money. Growth Strategy The money came in after the founders of Webwork launched adsbook.com in October. Investors were promised rich rewards for clicking on advertisements posted on the website. 
According to one report, over 400,000 investors had signed up in four months. The company's marketing campaign for luring investors went mainstream when Bollywood actors Shah, Shah Rukh Khan and Nawazuddin Namazuddin Siddiq endorsed Ad's book with televised endorsements. Shah Rukh Khan, in particular, is commonly seen as Bollywood's biggest star and figures among top 10 highest paid actors in the world. More pointedly, the founders of the website had collected 500 crore nearly $775 million from 200,000, quote, investors over the same period. The accused founders, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the accused founders reportedly purchased luxurious luxury automobiles, an Audi and a Mercedes-Benz for, uh, for two crores, about $310,000. Cash to Bitcoin. Unsurprisingly, the cash stream raised red flags, enough for banks to block bulk payments from the company to investors in late December. WebWorks founders switched gears and began asking investors to accept payments through Bitcoin. According to the Times of India, the company bought Bitcoin worth 13 crores, approximately 2 million, for payments to, to those who saw their returns cut off. An official complaint filed by one investor alleges that he paid out uh, 1.2 lots, about 2,600, with the promise of returns, on, uh, returns for clicks on advertisements for a year. According to News Report, the complaint added, People have invested heavily as they were influenced both by celebrities who have been named in, in the complaint. Meanwhile, a directive from a state high court has now seen the CBI take over the case, which sees the two founders of WebWork in violation of the Information Technology Act. <clears throat> Interest testing. Yeah, you know, um, scammers are everywhere, even in India. And, uh, yeah, it's it's not going to change. I, I I saw somewhere where uh, where one coin is still getting like indicted or or nailed or I I, I don't know. They're like getting investigated or getting getting something. I don't know. I didn't I didn't investigate it too hard, just because that's like that's one of those things where it's it's almost a meme for a scam. You know where oh. You know, like pay coin. You know, guaranteed twenty dollars a coin. <laughs> that that was that was your pegged currency. You know, and it, it went up and then it went down. <laughs> Come on now. You know, and uh, oh, and just a side note, I was looking here on uh, on one of these websites that actually tracks the price of Bitcoin. I've been noticing a uh, steady upward trend. I don't know if anybody else has, but uh, we're floating around there uh, just under $2,700. And, you know, that's uh, that's quite a bit of a recovery. You know, I mean, we were we were down as low as, like, what, 2100 bucks like, two weeks ago? And I... <laughs> I don't know how to say it. I mean, I'm, it's without segregated witness. It's without a governing body overseeing it. I mean, for the most part, there there are corporate interests involved, and then it, that kind of narrows the channels a little bit. But one thing to keep in mind is, in a lot of places, still, you can buy some miners, dedicate some electricity and some bandwidth to the venture of mining for Bitcoin. And you can get on that thing. And, and just if you look at the the upward trend, if you had started with your base estimate like at the beginning of the week, right? If you were looking at it and you're like, all right, at $2,100, it's going to take me three months to break even. Okay, well now, what's this price upgrade of nearly $2,700 going to do to that metric? You, you you now just went from from paying off in months to paying off in weeks, and in this trend, 
If it continues like this for another week or so, you're going to be paying off in days. So that that's the, the kind of mentality you have to take with regard to mining Bitcoin. You can't look at it as like, you know, the current the current situation, this is it's always going to be this way. You know, for for a month at $2100 a bitcoin, it's going to take me 12 months to pay off the fucking hardware and, and the electricity. It's going to take me 12 months before I hit break even. That's never proven true. It's why there are still miners out there that are still doing this. It's why you can go on fucking eBay and you can find miners there. That's not just people selling their hardware and getting out of it, folks. That's people rolling over their hardware. Okay, they've already got the replacements. They're looking at this shit going, what the fuck am I going to do with it? Oh, wait, there's a secondary market out there on fucking eBay. (laughs) You know, somebody will get some life out of it. Somebody will earn some Satoshis with it. But again, you you can't look at, at mining for Bitcoin on a linear path. It's not a linear path. The fact of the matter is is that for every Bitcoin that's mined, that is that many fewer Bitcoin that will ever be mined. It, it puts a whole different spin on this this, you know, supply and demand equi- equation, okay? And it, that alone ought to be enough to make people want to do this shit just just fucking legitimately, just fucking get into it. You know, I, if I had the money right now, I'd be buying fucking hardware and I'd be dedicating it to fucking mining because I know that whatever fucking fraction of a fucking nth of hash power I can dedicate to the enterprise, it's that much that's in my hands that'll be directing, uh, be directed according to my will out on the network. And big fucking whoop de doo. There's people with huge fucking warehouses full of miners. Eh, you know what? Jerk me off tomorrow about it. I don't give a fuck. It's not always going to be that way. And I was thinking about this earlier. You know, people look at the uh, quote, quote unquote centralization in China. That, that situation is not going to last forever. Those, those mining operations will only get so large before their, their electricity pool is interrupting with other people's necessities for electricities, or for electricity or energy or whatever. And it's going to come up to that bump and then it's going to increase the price of, of electricity. And then it's going to create an issue where the people that are living there can't fucking live there because they can't keep the lights on because all the electricity in the region is going to keeping the fucking miners competitive with the rest of the planet. And and this there's a a principle and it has never changed in any in anything associated with cryptocurrencies is that once you put your foot down and you buy hardware okay it's the the rest of the river hasn't stopped running you know it's like your your foot might be on the on the ground on but the the river is still running meaning that there are still technological developments that are coming out the next day that are making what you just bought obsolete and you are racing against time to hit break even and enjoy the span between break even and time to re up and you have to be live and active that entire time you know why why people can still find time to fuck off and pollute the goddamn mempool with a bunch of bullshit transactions just to get people to make upgrades that they didn't want 2 years ago and they still don't really want but there looks like there's some capitulation out there. Uh, I don't know why people can even bother with that. Is, it's beyond me. But it it was anticipated. It was entirely anticipated, and 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 I'll tell you right now, it's like whatever you dedicate your time and effort to doing in Bitcoin, there are people that because you done that they respond to it 
Okay, and so like with regard to the that little blip we had with regard to the the uh, mempool, you know what we saw? We saw way more interest in Ethereum. We saw way more interest in altcoins, other altcoins that had nothing to do with Bitcoin or well, very little to do with Bitcoin and even less to do with Ethereum. But more interest spanning to those because they had cheaper transaction fees. The market adjusted. You cannot ignore these facts. I mean, you could try and, and you can try and keep the focus all on Bitcoin and shit. But Bitcoin isn't the only thing happening in crypto. It hasn't been the only thing happening in crypto since about 2012. And people are just now still catching up to Bitcoin and they're coming into it and they see the brash attitude of fucking UASF people and they kind of glom onto that. Oh, yeah, we should. The, the oppression of the miners. Yeah, oppression of the fucking miners? Give me a break. It's like, it's like a meat eater going to a vegetarian's house, uninvited, by the way, around dinner time, seating themselves at the table and saying, I want a steak. And the, the rest of the people are like, dude, we, we, we don't eat meat here. And the guy's like, I don't give a fuck. I want a steak. And I'm like, dude, we haven't eaten meat in like 10 years. And, and we have absolutely no desire to eat meat. The guy's like, look, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to call up some friends and we're going to have fucking steak at your house. And you are going to fucking make it for us. I mean, literally, that's that's exactly what they're saying, you know? It's like, there is no oppression of the fucking miners. The only oppression is between your own fucking ears. You want to enjoy the reward of the miners? Get the fuck in the game, bitch. Add some depth to that network. Increase the integrity of it. Support your fucking VIPs the way they're supposed to be supported. If you manage to get a fucking 95% consensus on board with you, fuck yeah. There you go. You've got your fucking change. That's how it's supposed to operate. Not invite yourself to a vegetarian household and demand steak. It just fucking disgusts me. You know, and, and it's, they act like the, the Bitcoin is the only option out there. there. There's a bazillion fucking options out there now, folks. Don't let yourself be fooled to the idea that it's just Bitcoin anymore. I mean, as as much as I hate to mention it, Ripple. <laughs> you want something that does what Segregated Witness is going to do in Bitcoin? Ripple does everything that, it, that it'll do. You'll have your, your trusted nodes, you know. You'll, you, you've got all that already in the topology of Ripple. And the banks love it. You know, just like you want the banks to love Bitcoin, the banks love Ripple. So, you know, if you want what the banks love and the banks love Ripple, then go be, go enjoy Ripple. They've got your 40,000 transactions per second. They've got your, your cross-chain transaction bullshit. They've got your smart contract bullshit. They got all that. Now, why are you trying to bring it over to Bitcoin? If, if if the miners decided that that was the way to go with Bitcoin, they would either a mine Ripple, which I don't I don't even know are, are they even like proof of are are they proof of stake or like is are are they even dependent on their quote unquote token that people mine what what what. I don't know. It's been so long since I've read anything like that about Ripple that, I mean, yeah, I'm not going to go into it. Point point being that I've reviewed a lot of the paperwork on Ripple, and it does everything that supposedly Bitcoin, supposedly segregated witness, supposedly brings to Bitcoin. And, and like I said, the the bankers have just been throwing money at that shit left and right. I mean, you know. It's like if you don't, if the ICO game is a little bit too scammy for you, you know, it's too scam malicious. Go, go with your, go with that, uh, the whole trust model, you know, 
If you if you want a mommy and daddy to to oversee it, and you, you want regulation, and you want certification requirements, and all that other shit, go go do Ripple. They have all that already. Better yet, go back to Visa. You know they've got your forty thousand transactions per second. As a matter of fact, they're the people where that metric even comes from. Huh? Yeah. And, and like I said before, I didn't get in this to compete with with Visa on that level. You know, I don't. I don't really. As a matter of fact, I, I remember reading something somewhere that suggested that the the transaction volume of Bitcoin, the the uh, seven transactions per second or whatnot, that that was an intended impairment. Because if it can only put through seven th- seven transactions per second, that means if you want to do anything faster than that, you have to do it off lo- off chain. You have to take responsibility for those funds. But for the average person, okay, like you you set up your little uh, website where you got your T-shirt designs and all that other business, okay, y- you don't need to do. 40,000 transactions per second. If you do, you better upgrade your fucking production capacity because you are going to get buried in orders otherwise. Or you got to like outsource that shit or something because you're going to get fucking bombarded and you're not going to be able to keep up. <clears throat> got to strike while the iron ho- iron is hot, folks. Hot. You know? You don't want to be waiting until you fizzle out to upgrade your, your production capacity not 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 when you got to support 40,000 transactions per second and like i said there's already payment methods that have that capability we've covered it got ripple you got visa you know they they already got you covered man you got all that trust emblem bullshit you trust it anymore just cuz it's got a little sticker seal of approval or do you trust it more because it actually fucking works I, I trust it more because I can actually... Tr- I, I don't have to trust it, number one, because I can verify it. And, and I trust it more because it actually fucking works. And a speed that outpaces anything else that somebody has to offer me. And it's relatively free and open. You know? And, and that's the way I like it. And that's the way I hope it stays. You know, I, I think that... it. Cryptocurrencies as an endeavor, I think, left open and and undefined as it is, I think it will swarm around people using it for specific use cases. And it's not for some fucking ICO to determine what that use case is. It's for somebody to determine that in their own life. Now, you can have little frameworks and you can have specified networks and whatnot, but you're only going to reach a limited constituency. And those, uh, that'll be the, the people that you can actually give presentations to. You know, that, that guy out in Zimbabwe, it's not going to help him. It's not going to help him at all. I mean, unless unless maybe you can watch like a YouTube video of you instructing him, uh, instructing him how to how to make it worth his while. But I don't know. I, I think that maybe a a, a progression toward a, like CPU mining pools and stuff like that. Like if somebody were to think about it in terms of just providing some sort of competition to ASICs. You know, to where people be looking around in their house and saying, well, you know, what do I have that has enough computing power that it can actually hook up to the Internet that can provide a little bit of hashing power to this network? You know, I mean, I, I think that it's it's just ludicrous that, you know, people use those barriers of what's affordable right now as as some some sort of justification for not getting into the game. And I, I just, I, I find it fucking ludicrous. It, it, if all you did was, like, flip over what whatever you, you put in, you know, like, month over month, just flip it over. If you did that for, like, six months, you'd probably have enough left over 
that that you could like take some out and continue flipping but take some out and dedicate it to increasing your your hashing power and if you just keep doing that before you know it you're going to be looking at a rack of miners that are cranking you out enough money that you can take out some and maybe have a nice dinner with the lady and because you you've already got all your other expenses covered and, and you're breaking par you know that's that's the reward of participation and the, all this whining on fucking social media and shit it it doesn't achieve anything i mean it just makes people waste their time on fucking social media Anywho, enough of the ranting. I've been doing that uh, quite a bit today. But, I don't know. I, I think it was because I didn't quite get get an opportunity to uh, to get out of all of it out of my system while I was uh, on the mat today. I had to, I had to quite, kind of back off a couple roll sessions short of a complete class. And so I still have a little, a little bit of aggression in me. <laughs> anyway, um, back to articles. And I got this one here. It seems this one is kind of uh, kind of interesting because we've been seeing an increase in uh, malware and a diversity of uses of it. And uh, this one is on 8btc.com. It was written by Cindy23. And so I'm going to assume Cindy does not have a penis because there is no picture to lead us to believe otherwise. So here we go. ICO investors lose all their money when reads a white paper encoded with viruses. An ICO investor reported June 29th he fell victim to a scam in which he was led to believe a startup is doing an ICO project. Alex said he received a zip file with a detail with detailed information about the project and found 80 found his 80,000 yuan worth of ethereum disappeared the next day. The the con man whose QQ number is 4529529 added Alex this Thursday claiming that he that he is working in on an ICO project and wishes Alex to help check the white paper. He said something nice about Alex and asked him to support his project. The criminal promised Alex that if everything worked out fine, he could get some kickback. Alex took the bait. He received a zip file detailing everything he needs to know about the project. When he was about to give some feedback on the white paper this morning, he was shocked to find that he lost 80,000 yuan worth of Ethereum. The worst is yet to come. Alex searched the QQ number on Baidu and realized that the crook had been asking questions about how to bypass an antivirus on several hacker forums. An antivirus works to detect viruses through two main ways, signature-based detection and suspicious behavior. To cheat an antivirus, it involves a lot of encoding work. You can learn learn about how <laughs> you can learn about 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 it. Oh, you fucker. Cindy, god damn it. Two abouts. You can learn about it at Symantec HTTP Seman oh I'm sorry, Secmaniac. Uh, blog 2010 slash 02 slash 24 set Viva. I'm not going to read it all. When Alex shared his story in an ICO group, he was surprised to hear that he was not the only victim. Some investors lost 180,000 yuan and some at least 1 million yuan. Now Alex has reported it to the police. Good man. These victims all received an ICO file and the antivirus failed to detect some malware in it. They read the white paper all night long in hopes of giving some useful advice and expected to get some rewards, but there is no such thing as called read my white paper, I'll pay you. Um, t- 
Tan Guping or Gaoping, Tan Gaoping, uh, founder of Bitbill, said this morning that one of his colleagues lost all of his cryptocurrencies. He has been using I Am Token Wallet, and his assets were transferred last night without his knowledge. He is now talking with the company to see if there's any way to get his assets back. Yeah. Well, thank you, Cindy. Uh, you need to work on your editing skills. And and from the picture, it appears as though you have no penis. Good. No false advertising. Anyway, uh, yeah. Apparently, people's greed has been getting the best of them. And they are breaking one of the cardinal rules in response. And that's accepting software from an unknown party and unloading it into one's computer. That's like one of those cardinal rules of, of the internet that you kind of like, you kind of avoid. I mean, it's like, for something like that, like a PDF or something, you, you'd think you'd be able to like find it on a website somewhere, right? Because, I mean, that's what normal people do is... You know, I, I find all kinds of white papers all over the fucking place and read them on this show, as a matter of fact. But that's that's like the ordinary means of delivery for any kind of, I don't know, I, cryptocurrency project. You know, that or, you know, Bitcoin Talk or Reddit or, you know, GitHub or... Half a dozen other places, or half a million other places. I mean, it is the internet. You can invent your own place for it. You know, the Oro Orocoin people certainly did an excellent job in designing their website. But when you read a little bit deeper beneath the skin, yeah, you find out it's a bunch of bullshit. But you know, it, you can't you can't blame people for trying. You know. But you can call them an asshole for trying. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, throw back down into some music here. And uh, I've been dying to play Ministry. I've been playing the shit out of Rio Grande Blood, though. So I'm going to go with another song off of this album that I do enjoy, nonetheless. And it's Lies, Lies, Lies here on Coin Metal. And that was In the Meantime by Helmet. <sighs> I don't know what it is. I, I was trying to put on some infectious grooves there. And for whatever reason, man, that thing just skipped right on over to Helmet. It's like, nope. I don't see any infectious grooves here. I don't understand it. Anyway. Just clicking through my tabs here. Still kind of uncertain as to what direction to take us here. But I did see this one on CNBC, and I, I suspected or hold it in suspect only because of the first word in here. NATO says a state actor was behind the massive ra ransomware attack and could trigger military response. <sighs> I'm, I haven't actually read this thing yet. I'm just going to take a guess that they're probably talking about striking Russia um, because of this thing. And I, I find that... Com I don't know. Uh, look, state actor. Personally, I think if there's a state actor involved, it's the NSA. Because they created the fucking shit to begin with. And they've been sitting on this fucking exploit for years. So if there's a quote-unquote state actor involved, I believe the NSA could be considered that. Anyway, continuing. We're not going to read the bullet points. A quote, state actor was behind the cyber attack that hit over 12,000 devices in around 65 countries on Tuesday, hitting major industries from advertising to oil, according to NATO. The Petya ransomware attack encrypted files on a computer and demanded $300 worth of the cryptocurrency Bitcoin in order to unlock them. 
Kaspersky Lab estimates at least 2,000 targets were affected mostly in Russia and the Ukraine, but attacks were registered in several other countries, including Germany, the UK, and China. Researching the attack, NATO says it was likely launched by a state actor or by a non-state actor with support and approval from a state as the operation was very complex and expensive. The operation was not too complex, but still complex and expensive enough to have been prepared and executed by unaffiliated hackers for the sake of practice. Cyber criminals are not, not behind this either, as the method for collecting the ransom was so poorly designed that the ransom would probably not even cover the cost of, oper of the operation, NATO's Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence said in press release on Friday. <clears throat> The implications of this mean that the cyber attack could be interpreted as an act of war, according to the organization. On Wednesday, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said a cyber attack could tr trigger Article 5, the principle of collective defense. As important government systems have been targeted, then in case the operation is attributed to a state, this could count as a violation of sovereignty. Consequently, this could be an internationally wrongful act, which might give the targeted states several options to respond with countermeasures, Thomas Manerick, researcher at NATO's CCDCOE law branch in the press release. NATO investigators added that the cyber attack was a declaration of power and a demonstration of the culprit's ability to cause disruption. More than 30% of affected firms were financials, according to analysts by Kaspersky Lab, while at least half of those, were tar those targeted were industrial organizations such as utilities, oil and gas, transportation, logistics, manufacturing, and other companies. The nature of this malware is such that it could easily stop the operation of a production facility for a considerable amount of time, said Kirill Kruglov, security expert at Kaspersky Lab, in a press release published on Thursday. Initially, it seemed the attack was caused by cyber criminals looking to extract ransom, ransoms from victims. But NATO's analyst, analysis appears to put this theory aside. In terms of the Bitcoin ransom demanded, it appears the attackers haven't made much. Only a total of 3.99 Bitcoins has been paid in ransom so far, so far with a total of $10,000 or $10,284 at today's Bitcoin price. Even if someone paid the ransom, the associated email address has been shut down by the web provider. This means victims cannot get their files back and any encrypted files are effectively lost. The underlying motive appears to be aimed at wreaking the maximum amount of disruption in Ukrainian infrastructure while merely operating under the guise of ransomware, said Tyler Mofit, a senior threat research analyst with cybersecurity forum WebRoot, in a blog post on Thursday. This suspicion is supported by the absence of a payment portal or functional email address to deliver the ransom payment. Other, other experts have echoed this. Cisco's security research organization, Talos, said the intent of the attacker behind the cyber attack was destructive, not economically motivated, in a blog post updated on Thursday. Gavin O'Gorman, investigator at Symantec, Symantec Security Response, shared two theories for the motive behind the attack. The first is that it was caused by a technologically capable but not otherwise smart criminal as they only used one Bitcoin wallet and gave just one email account to contact which will make it difficult to receive and make use of any ransom. 
The other theory is that it was intended to cause as much disruption as possible. Perhaps this attack was never intended to make money, rather to simply disrupt a large number of Ukrainian organizations launching an attack that would wipe victim hard drives I'm sorry, that would wipe victim hard drives would, would achieve the same effect. However, that would be an overly aggressive action, O'Gorman said in a blog post published on Wednesday. Effectively wiping hard drives through the pretense of ransomware confuses the issue, leaving victims and investigators to ask, are the attackers politically motivated or criminally motivated? Or O'Gorman added that he believed the attacks were criminally motivated. So, not politically. Ah, so, maybe it wasn't the NSA, maybe it was a few really sophisticated attackers... And their, the means of paying them was terminated, so the ability to pay them was terminated, and thus they were not able to get paid, and it just looks like some state actor because of that factoid. I don't know. I, I think that it's just as likely that a state actor is using that software um, as it is that an individual attacker who who was just smart enough to coordinate his shit to span the attack to happen at multiple vectors from multiple points of attack I mean it's entirely possible you know you can you can seize control of a computer here or seize control of a computer there and deploy as you will My apologies, had to get a little water there. It's one of those one of those drawbacks of being human. But you know, I don't think you would be listening any other way, right? <clears throat> and so um I keep seeing this uh this reoccurring theme and every time I see it, I know that it's a scam. And I know it's a scam for a few reasons. But for whatever reason, I keep seeing it anyway. You know, it keeps popping back up again and again and again. And what it is, is commodity-backed cryptocurrencies. Now, I, I've said before, I don't care if you've got video cameras pointed at a stack of gold, whatever. I, I don't care. The, the, the gold isn't going to be there. Somebody's going to figure out how to put the fucking camera on a loop that that you can't fucking tell for the first 12 hours of its disappearance. But the gold will be fucking gone and that that's all there is to it. Or worse yet, that it wasn't really the person's gold that said it said it was their gold, like they were holding it for somebody else who is maybe holding it for somebody else. And and the, the line of of god damn it, what's that word? The line of custody was such was confused to the point where this person could claim ownership, at least pro tem, and then after everybody gets invested in it, it just the the real persons come forward and say, "I want my fucking gold back," and there 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 goes your gold. And of course, they don't bother to tell the investors until like a month later or something like that. And then by then, you know, nobody's able to get their gold and everybody's freaking out and and everything that was dependent on it gets fucked. Well, the the article that I'm going to read here is emblematic of the the loss of of actual note of ownership of the gold. And uh, exactly how much gold there is by ratio to amount of paper there is outstanding. And so here it is. This one is on uh, investmentresearchdynamics.com. God damn, that's a long fucking URL. Central Bank Intervention Slams Paper Gold. And this was on June 26, 2017. Financial Markets, Gold Market Manipulation, Precious Metals, BIX, COMEX, Gold, Fake News, Gold Smack, LBMA, Propaganda. 
This isn't some trader's, quote, fat, fat finger accidentally overloading the sell button and pressing sell. This is unadulterated BIS slash ECB slash BOE slash Fed sponsored market intervention. And then there's a chart here of the August COMEX paper gold central bank footprints all over this tape. And there's a huge fucking drop. It looks a lot like that fucking Ethereum tank, man. I mean, it, it huge dip. Anyway. At 4.01 Eastern Standard Time, a paper gold nuclear bomb was detonated in the COMEX Global Computer Systems system. The graph above is just the August, quote, front month paper gold contract on the COMEX. In that contract, 1.49 million ounces of paper gold were dumped into the COMEX electronic trading system. Zero Hedge is attributing 1.88 million ounces. That would include these these selling in all the paper gold contract months. But that's not the entire amount of gold of the paper hit. There would have been a large amount of LBMA gold forward forward paper gold contracts dumped in correlation with the COMEX paper avalanche. ZH attributes $2.2 billion, in, billion dollars in paper gold dumped, but the real number, including LBMA forwards dumped, was much larger. Quote, this mysterious plunge has the market spooked, says some idiot named Bob Habercorn from RJO. This was not, quote, mysterious, it was intentional. A shock and awe market intervention that was intended to quote spook the market. That quote is from a Bloomberg full report full of fake news. Caution: This article contains fake news. Blah, and I'm not going to go into that. the The article claims that China bought less from Hong Kong in May. In fact, the amount of gold exported from Switzerland to India and Hong Kong was up 39 percent from April, according to Platts. Furthermore, we have no clue how much gold moves into China through Beijing and Shanghai, numbers which are intentionally hidden from the world. There's a re- Here's the reason that today was selected by the BIS at all to attack gold in the paper market in an effort to scare the crap out of the market. The day was well chosen as the Muslim world, including Turkey, was closed for the end of Ramadan, as was India, which has the amiable, amiable habit of observing the holidays of religious minorities, from John Brun- Brimelow's gold jottings. Two of the largest buyers of physical gold in the world right now, India plus Turkey, were closed for the observance of a religious holiday, and Shanghai closed for the day 31 minutes before the dump, before the paper dump. Oh, I'm sorry. And Shanghai closed for the day 31 minutes before the paper dump. 4 a.m. Eastern Standard Time is one of the slowest, lowest volume, uh, volume trading periods during any 24-hour period. Why would a seller of a large number of contracts sell at that time of day when the largest buyers of what is being sold are not in the market at the same time of the sale? If it were merely a, quote, fat finger, the fake news narrative, then the mistake would have been immediately corrected and the price would have quickly quickly recovered. Anyone who buys the quote fat finger story is either tragically ignorant or hopelessly naive. When India returns tonight to the market, I would expect gold to get a strong bid. Indians have a habit of buying gold, a lot more physically deliverable gold than they might have otherwise when the Western Central Banks put gold, quote, on sale by lowering the price in the paper market. I suspect Turkey and China will increase their appetite as well. The mining stocks, per the HUI, barely acknowledge the artificial price takedown. The HUI is down less than 1%. In the past, on a day when gold was taken down to this degree, the HUI would have dropped at least 4-5%. to 
It's almost as if mining stock traders are laughing at the latest central bank antics. I know I am. Hmm. <clears throat> oh, wow. <laughs> Related is your gold missing. <laughs> Whew. Well, there you have it, folks. Now, that that's, that's just happening in the gold market. And again, this was... Where's the person that wrote this? Who's the author? It's unattributed. So, I'm assuming this is probably from somebody else's article. Anyway, point being that... You know, th this shit is happening in, in gold right now. Okay, so now... Assume that you do have a cryptocurrency that's quote-unquote pegged to gold. Okay, now never mind that there's an interceding factor there with the uh, fiat currency which gives us a value of your cryptocurrency in fiat and our, the value of the gold in fiat. Okay, so but never mind whatever whatever price action might be happening with that particular medium in this equation this is just happening on gold and you're supposedly going to peg a deterministically cr mined current currency to this is something going through this kind of action i don't think so i mean you've got manipulation in the fiat markets the the regulated fiat markets by the by the biggest players in it you know the people that run the swift networks they were fucking one another on the goddamn interest rates or the central banks were on on the interest rates and point being that there's there is industrial systemic level fraud going on in quote unquote regulated markets okay and so you're going to try and pay a cryptocurrency to that. That's that's hard enough. Okay, the best you can do is an exchange rate, which is what we've got as a quote-unquote price for Bitcoin. That's why it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. It's because there's all kinds of factors happening on the Bitcoin side. There's all kinds of ha factors happening on the fiat side. And so it causes that volatility. Okay, now introduce into that all of this manipulation and bullshit going into the gold market and you're somehow going to develop some sort of bridging layer that bridges physical gold to a fiat currency to a cryptocurrency and you're, you're supposedly going to bridge all of that with all the little market factors happening in all three of those sectors you're not going to be able to do it I don't give a fuck how good you are. I, I don't give. I don't care how many years you've been deving or whatever. I mean, I would. I would not even put Ve Verge Dev to the task, even as capable an individual as he is. I mean, he might be able to to develop some sort of synthesis for you, you know. But it'll always be a backward-looking market, you know, because the. It will only be able to be based on what has already happened or what is already happening, not what actually will happen. Because there's there's just too much variance there. You know, and I, I see these coins like uh, Vericoin, where they've got Varium and Vericoin. That, that decoupling of value, I mean, I don't see it as working over the long term. I'll just say that. I see plenty of potential for fraud, plenty of potential for gaming, making one cryptocurrency into two cryptocurrencies or a cryptocurrency backed by another cryptocurrency. It's not going to help you. Associating another value to something that supposedly has value through its own finiteness and the public participation of it in it is not going to make it any more valuable. It's either going to have value to the community, value enough that they're they're relying on it to transact for goods and services, or it's not. You know, and some of these people that are that are so seg segwit in love, you know, they think just because Bitcoin has such a network that that means 
they need to fucking take it over and they need to fucking make it do what they want it to do. Hey, you know what? Fuck you. There's plenty of other fucking games out there for you to play in. There's there's plenty of other places for you to be. And in all honesty, I think you're just wasting your time and your energy trying to get Bitcoin to do what you want it to do. And I hope I'm right. I could be wrong. I hope I'm right. I think it, at the very least we'll end up with two coins if the USA, UASF people actually go through with their fucking chicken shit. Or their, their game of chicken, I should say. Anywho, a gun to the head is not how you get consensus. Sorry, folks. That is just the fact of life. Oi! Anywho, I want to go ahead and throw down a little bit of music, because it's been a little bit. And as far as what to play, I'm going to go ahead and get a little bit old school with the Fear Factory here, a little demanufacture here on Coin Metal. And that was Prong with Universal Law. <clears throat> I swear, man. <laughs> This thing is so weird. It's like it, it'll just play all the songs all the way through until I go to actually select a specific one and then it's just like, nah, I don't want to play that one. So, you know, I I just got to go with what it wants to play, man. <laughs> Anywho, as we're coming into our last hour, we've gotten through the disassociation between coins and gold and how the two can never be like intrinsically linked now let's talk about the the other interceding factor between that if you were to ever try and peg a commodity to a cryptocurrency that would be fiat currency which it, it would exist as an intermediate intermediary between the two it always does anyway this one is on uh, bitcoin bitcoinwarrior.net excessive leverage is now the biggest problem facing markets and this was authored on june 29th 2017 by rupert hargreaves clearly has a penis excessive leverage poses a huge risk to markets during the past few, few during the past few past few what during the past few the bank of england and european european central bank have joined the us federal reserve so that must be during the past few years as the ecb and bank of england had all been doing quantitative easing for some time anyway join the u.s federal reserve and the bank of japan by issuing relatively hawkish statements on monetary policy signaling what could be the beginning of the end of the great post financial crisis central bank experiment fed raises rates despite data we might actually get into that one even though some might welcome the end to the over easy monetary policy reducing stimulus and raising interest rates is not going to be an easy task during the past decade consumers and companies have piled on a record amount of debt taking advantage of low interest rates and banks have been more than happy to accommodate the demand excessive leverage is a is massive problem dude it is a massive problem come on rupert is that rupert rupert's his name right yep rupert get with it man and analysts and policymakers have been increasingly warning about the risks rising of rising leverage pose to the financial system federal reserve vice chairman stanley fisher warned earlier this week that while excessive leverage among financial institutions is at historically low levels quote the corporate business sector appears to be notably leveraged with the current aggregate corporate sector leverage standing nearly tw near 20-year highs 
but investors don't seem phased. The yields on high-yield securities remain at record lows, a development that has been attributed to investor overconfidence. Earlier this month, Bloomberg cited comments from Society General and analyst An- Andrew La- Lapthorne, who, de- who claimed that excess leverage in the system is disguised in the S&P 500 because these risky stocks are typically small and the big guys are putting up the market right now. He went on to say, but credit markets are not bothered. The overconfidence may be misplaced. Analysts at Bank of America seem to agree. In a report issued earlier this week, credit analyst Hans Merkelson points out that the bank believes the current largest risk to U.S. markets is U.S. high-grade corporate bond spreads. Even though leverage is a factor, Michelson or Mickelson, yeah, Mickelson, and team are more concerned about a large increase in global interest rates led by foreign countries. In that situation, we could lose the foreign inflows that dominate buying in our market. Get a rates get a rate stock domestically and get a rates shock domestically and large retail investor outflows from bond funds and ETFs, he writes. Ultra-easy monetary policy by central banks overseas has published international investors into has published international investors into the high high I'm sorry into the US high yield market and companies have been more than happy to meet this extra demand. However, corporate America's debt binge could come back to haunt its central banks overseas I'm sorry could haunt it as central banks overseas turn hawkish Mickelson's report points out that since 2007 the size of the US high yield market has tripled in value to 6.3 trillion an expansion driven by quote the Fed's super easy monetary policy generating positive bond price performance that attracted retail inflows to bond funds and ETFs. And increasingly in recent years, yield-sensitive foreign investors, this means there's a strong risk of partial un- unwinding, uh, unwind, what? Partial unwind leading to much higher yields when foreign central banks tighten monetary policies. Wow. That was very convoluted, dude. Uh, Yeah. I don't know what to make of that. Other than the fact that it seems like there's a lot of market manipulation going on on the value side of the fiat currencies. So, again, here, here we have it. You know, people... You can't do it. You cannot mark a. You cannot peg a cryptocurrency to to a commodity. Just get it out of your head right now. You know, it, either your cryptocurrency can stand on its own, or it's fluff and bullshit. You know, backed by Ethereum, backed by Ripple, backed. By, fuck you. I mean, really now, it, it's completely unnecessary. I mean, it, it, it's this reaching for trust. You can't trust shit. All you can do is confirm. You know, if you, if you try and mar- migrate away from confirm, you're going to run in, back into trust again. The further you deviate from confirm, the more you're, you're back into, into, uh, into trust or verify. You know, if you, if you can't verify it, you're drifting right back into trust again. And, and that should be avoided. I mean, really, these systems are meant to work without trust. They're meant, they're meant to work by verification. If it doesn't fucking verify, it was probably not a legitimate transaction. That's why we don't really need regulators. I, I, I find it embarrassing, really, that, that regulators or, or any state or, or government officials are even looking at us. 
I mean, especially considering what, what kind of manipulation we just talked about. I mean, really, consider that kind of manipulation going on on the back end of the market and what the expanded, protracted fucking effects are in the global market at large. I mean, really now, folks. You know, I, I'm sure you've noticed that things, uh, portion sizes are getting a little bit smaller, you know. I, I, I purchase some, some processed foods and I eat them on a virtually daily basis. And I've noticed the shrinkage in the size and the volume of the products that I'm purchasing. And that, that's telling me that my, the Federal Reserve note is losing value against those commodities, those hard commodities. And so, you know, again, when, when we're talking about things like cryptocurrencies in general, like Bitcoin, and we're talking about the quote-unquote price and the exchange rate and how it's gone back up about $400 in less than a week and a half, that's not just communicating to you a confidence or a confidence in Bitcoin or an expansion of its infrastructure or its capabilities or its throughput or whatever. It's also communicating to you a lack of confidence growing in fiat markets and, and also a, a lack of valuation of those fiat currencies against cryptocurrencies. You know, there's only going to be so many Bitcoin. Well, fuck, there's no cap on the Federal Reserve note. I mean, that's why a lot of people seek to fork away from it. Because it, it I mean, wh when you're considering cryptocurrencies, when somebody tells you that the cryptocurrency does not have a cap, that, that loses, uh, immediately loses 30% of its interest for you, I'm sure. I mean, if it doesn't, then you're just silly and you don't know what you're dealing with and you probably shouldn't be investing anything in cryptocurrencies because you're going to get wrecked. I mean, there are a few coins out there that supposedly still have some sort of utility and value, even though they are capless, um, like Doge. Um, that one's been seeing some sort of interest or some sort of recurrence of interest um, as of late. Um, but that was in in the light of what was going on with Bitcoin and, and the fee market just going completely outrageous. So, you know, Doge people, thank the UASF people. You know, because apparently they've been spamming the network really hard and get that fucking mempool expanded just to make the case for their, their modification on the network. And that diverted plenty of interest over into you and other altcoins that have been around for since, what, 2013? I think that, that was Doge's year, 2012 or 2013, when we started seeing altcoins. <clears throat> Actually, I think 2011 was Litecoin, and then there was like a couple others in there. I want to say it was 2011. It was either 2011 or 2012. I, I, I can't remember, and I'm sure Google knows. So if you really want to know, you can find out. But the point being that just being around that long, it, it says a lot about a coin. You know, we, we've been a lot around for quite a while. You know, and the fact that we're still around is it's kind of a tribute to uh, certainly Verge Dev or Sunrock, whichever you come to know him as. Um... I, I'm sure that we wouldn't have existed as independently as we have without him. But to the end, boy, we are coming up to the end. What we got about uh, we got about 26 minutes left. Just about 24 minutes left. That's at least enough time to get in another article. And I think we've covered plenty of pet, yeah. And, you know, the, this one seems kind of interesting. Um, and, and we have a little bit of time to occupy it. We covered the um, last time about hackers and how the NSA had um, contracted people to make some not-so-nice software. And that got disseminated out into the public. Um, thus providing 
plenty of obfuscation and plausible deniability. Um, you know, we've already seen plenty of ping- fingers being pointed at quote unquote state actors trying to say that Petya was one of them. I mean, really, it's going to take some 14 year old hacker to come up and say, It was me! I did it all! Fuck you, motherfuckers! And yes, it was worth $10,000 for me to do it. You know, and I would have made more, but you canceled my payment methods, and so, screw you. I mean, it, wouldn't that be interesting? Anyway, uh, this one is on Reuters.com. Despite hacking charges, U.S. tech industry fought to keep ties to Russian spy service. And uh, this one was put out on uh, June 30th, 2017. 449 EDT and this is by Joel Joel Scheitman or um, Dustin Voles and Jack Stubbs uh, Washington slash Moscow. Editor's note attention to language in paragraph 22 may be offensive to some readers. Paragraph 22? Oh. What these guys call paragraphs are like two sentences so I'm not too held up by the volume. Anyway, let's continue. As U.S. officials investigated that in, Jan- in January, the FSB's alleged role in election cyber attacks, U.S. technology firms were quietly lobbying the government to soften a ban on dealing with the Russian spy agency, people with direct knowledge of the effort told Reuters. New new U.S. sanctions put in place by former President Barack Obama last December, part of a broad suite of actions taken in response to Russia's alleged meddling in the 2016 presidential, presidential election, had made it a crime for American companies to have any business relationship with the FSB or Federal Security Service. Previous ruder cyber coverage. Under pressure, Western tech firms bow to Russian demands to share cyber secrets. More cyber risk news. And that's that's a different article we're not going to get into today. U.S. authorities had accused the FSB, along with the GRU, Russia's military intelligence agency, of orchestrating cyber attacks on the campaign of Democratic presidential election candidate Hillary Clinton, a charge Moscow denies. And we already know it was Seth, and he's been since murdered. So, never mind. But the sanctions also threaten to imperil the Russian sales operations of Western tech companies. Under the little understood arrangement, the FSB doubles as a regulator, charged with approving the import of to Russia of almost all technology that contains encryption, which is used in both sophisticated hardware as well as products like cell phones and laptops. Worried about the sales impact, business industry groups, including the U.S.-Russia Business Council and the American Chamber of Commerce in Russia, contacted U.S. officials at the American Embassy in Moscow and the Treasury, State, and Commerce Departments, according to five people with direct knowledge of the lobbying effort. The campaign, which began in January and proved successful in a number of weeks, has not been previously reported. In recent years, Western technology companies have acceded to increasing demands by Moscow for access to closely guarded product security secrets, including the source code, Reuters reported last week. Oh, man. Man, jiu-jitsu took it out of me today. Mm. Russia's information technology market is expected to reach $18.4 billion this year, according to market research researcher International Data Corporation. The sanctions would have meant the, the Russian market was dead for U.S. electronics, said Alexis Rodzienko, president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Russia, who argued against the new restrictions. Every Russian has an iPhone, 
iPad, so they would all switch to Samsung's, he said. A spokesperson for the U.S. Commerce Department Bureau of Industry and Security declined to comment. A State Department official said Wednesday said when Washington considered a range of factors before amending the FSB sanctions and regularly works with U.S. companies to assess the impact of such policies. The lobbyists argued the sanction could have stopped the sale of cars, medical devices, and heavy equipment, all of which also often contain encrypted software, according to a person involved in the lobbying effort. The goal of the sanctions was to sever U.S. business dealings with the FSB, not end American technology exports to Russia entirely, the industry groups argued. That's actually the intent of it, but people weren't actually considering the entire implications, apparently. The sanction was against a government agency that has many functions, only one of them being hacking the U.S. elections, said Rodzienko, and that, that isn't really true. They, they weren't hacking the elections. The lobbyists assembled representatives from the tech, automotive, and manufacturing sectors to make the case to the U.S. Treasury Department, said the persons involved in the lobbying effort. The industry groups did not argue against the intent of the sanction. Huh. I get it. But asked for a narrower exemption that would allow them to continue to seek regulatory approvals from the FSB while still keeping in place the broader ban on doing business with the spy agency. Punishment for Very Bad Acts The industry groups represent a number of technology firms with a large presence in Russia, including Cisco and Microsoft. Reuters was unable to determine which companies were directly involved in the lobbying. Microsoft said it did not ask for changes to the sanctions. In a statement, Cisco said it did also not seek any changes to the sanction, but it asked the Treasury Department for clarification on how it applied. In order to get encrypt encrypted technology into Russia, te companies need to obtain the blessing of the S FSB, a process that can sometimes take months or even years of negotiation. Before granting that approval, the agency can demand sensitive security data about the product, including source code, instructions that control the basic operations of computer equipment. The United States has accused Russia oh, God damn it. Oh. has accused Russia of a number of a growing number of cyber attacks against the of, against the West. US officials say they are concerned that Moscow's review of product secrets could be used to find vulnerabilities to hack into the products. Oh you mean like the NSA does? Some US government officials rejected the industry group's arguments they openly embraced the prospect of any ripple effect that cut further trade with Russia. Because they're a bunch of fucking idiots. Kevin Wolf was Assistant Secretary at the Commerce Department and oversaw export control policy when the FSB sanction was put in place. <clears throat> Wolf said within days of the sanction taking effect, Commerce received numerous calls from industry groups and companies warning of the unintended consequences. But for Wolf, who was furious with Moscow over the alleged cyber attacks, any additional curbs on trade with Russia was a bonus rather than an unintended downside. I said, great, terrific, fuck them. The whole point is to interfere with trade, recounted Wolf. The sanction was meant to impose pain on Russia and send a signal as punishment for very bad acts. Wolf left the Commerce Department when Pres President Donald Trump took office on January 20th. Other officials felt the impact on legitimate trade was too great. 
The intention of the sanction was not to cut off tra uh, tech trade with Russia, said a U.S. official with direct knowledge of the process. The lobbyists had also argued that since the sanctions only applied to U.S. technology makers, it would put them at a disadvantage to European and Asian companies who would still be able to interact with the FSB and sell products to Russia. We were asking for a narrower, narrow technical fix that would give a fair deal for U.S. companies, Dan Russell, CEO of the U.S.-Russia Business Council, said in an interview. The advocacy worked. State and Treasury officials began working to tweak the sanction in January before Obama left office, according to people involved in the process. On February 2nd, the Treasury Department created an exemption to the sanction about two weeks after Trump took office to allow tech companies to continue to obtain approvals from the FSB. Yeah, good move. Jesus Christ. You know, what is it with Obama? Why, why was he so anti-Russia? And, and, you know, I really don't understand the, the anti-Russia sentiment that's, that's promulgated in U.S. media. I really don't. You know, because as far as I'm concerned, we really couldn't have better friends when it comes to dealing with ISIS. You know, they seem, they seem to be pretty intent on, on killing ISIS. And, you know, I, I, I think that's a good thing. You know, killing ISIS and getting rid of them. But that, that's just me, you know, and, and why, uh, why we have any kind of alliance with people that are dealing with ISIS is beyond me. You know, we're supposedly fighting these people. We're supposedly fighting this global war on terror, right? You know, <laughs> but of course you can't have a global war on terror if you don't have terrorists, right? So you have to arm the terrorists so you have terrorists to fight. Oi, an especially long water break there, I know. Anyway, so yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much that. For various reasons, you cannot combine a cryptocurrency with either a fiat currency or a commodity. And, you know, we, we covered it from all fronts, except for, of course, cryptocurrency. But, you know, that... I'm speaking to a cryptocurrency interested crowd primarily, so you know we gotta we gotta take that in stride. <laughs> that that that's kind of an assumption that you know you guys are already oriented with cryptocurrencies, but you know sometimes I think I think some of y'all are a little bit like too buried in it and don't understand that what is happening in cryptocurrencies isn't specifically like all to do with just cryptocurrencies that there are impacts from fiat currencies and if you're interceding with com some other commodity in between or in addition to or an addendum to or an association with you're also going to be subject to whatever market volatility or mar market factors that that commodity suffers or, or enjoys you know, I mean, I, I hate to be such a Debbie Downer because I, I focus a lot on the negative impacts, but that's because I'm, I'm like trying to keep people like apprised that there are such a thing. You know, it's, it's really easy to get all tantalized and whatnot with the promises of Lambo land and, you know, we're going to see the moon and, you know, we're going to exit the stratosphere, all that other business. You know, it's, it's really easy to get caught up in that in that chatter, in that conversation, or, you know, I don't know even if that is a conversation, just a bunch of people yelling, you know, we're going to go to the moon. I mean, anyway, point being that it's easy to get caught up in that. And it's easy to disregard the risks and the signals you see of risk along the way in pursuit of your goal. But I, re I really think the the challenge is understanding which ones are factual and which ones are are being either 
created by your bias or propagated by your bias. You know, understand your own vision of things and try and understand that there's there's invariably going to be a difference between how you see things and how they really are. I mean, I entertain the possibility that everything I've said on this show for the last few hours is complete bullshit. And you know what? Tomorrow will probably prove me to be that way. Or may. I mean, I only entertain the the idea of doing this show because for the most part, I, I seem to be right. So, <laughs> you know, I, I attribute it to, uh, to having sat around and watched a lot of this shit as it's churned along and like I said I've said this before but it's all cyclical you know we're seeing the re-expression of interest in in cryptocurrencies and we're seeing the deviation of it into expressions of scam coins only this time around it's just popping up in ICOs and and other claims that you can associate a cryptocurrency or a crypto token to some other form of value and that that's somehow going to imbue it with some trust level you know something that you can you can bank on I, I'm sorry Mary that that day is gone the the day when you could implicitly trust anything even the price of Bitcoin or its vertical nature uh, of volatility over time you can't trust in any of it it's all ephemeral it's all temporary and all the market factors that we face today will not be the ones that we face tomorrow. The issues that we face tomorrow will be vastly different from the ones that we face today. And so there is no reason to be so assertive as to try and make mistakes based on the current current ramifications of the market. You know, you can't like I was saying before, you two weeks ago, if you were to be pricing out your your profitability on a, a particular set of hardware and you didn't act okay say you you looked at it and you said oh fuck tw- it took a major dip there's great potential that it's going to tank even harder i'm not going to put my foot forward i'm not going to buy those s9s or s7s or whatever it was i'm not going to do that and i'm not going to uh i'm not going to face that decline you know if if that was the case then Sorry, man. But if you did go ahead and put your foot forward, you've enjoyed a vast deviation from that $2,100 up to 26 crouching on $2,700 per Bitcoin. And so whatever you guessed yesterday about your profitability ratio, it is gone. It is no longer relevant. So there is no reason to institutionalize the the under underachievement of today you know i mean i i i just i don't see the necessity for it there are too many options available there are too many other ways to do exactly what certain people who are facing friction in cryptocurrencies would like to do and you know what if there is enough market interest in what you are trying to do they will follow you if you build it, they will come. And if you're good enough at it, they might just stick around for a little while. <laughs> and anyway, I want to go ahead and close this one up, button it up for the week. It has been exciting. It's been terribly painful as far as jujitsu is concerned. It's been terribly entertaining as far as Bitcoin is concerned. Uh, it's been a little sideways as far as Verge is concerned, but I see... I see in the cards some great upward potential there. And so next week, Monday, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time is when we will be back. Until then, you will be able to find me in the IRC chat room for Verge Currency. Uh, you'll also be able to find me on Twitter and Facebook. I, I have been recording this episode, and to my knowledge, it has been faithfully recording and barring any massive fuck-ups between now and... And we, when we finally close out this episode and I finally get it all saved, it will be up on the YouTube channel in a few hours, maybe tomorrow at the latest, um, for your listening pleasure. And if you're, if you're not entirely into the music, we understand. We got you covered, fam. It will be there without music. 
And so, yeah, until Monday, I want you all to trade safe because you know what? what? What you guess today will not be tomorrow, and it could just go up. I want you to do your homework because no matter how sophisticated or regulated or whatever this market gets, there will always be people that are trying to steal your money. And if you do not do your homework, you may just give it to them. And watch out for your bunghole, because number two will be proven to, to be to be completely true and completely correct today, tomorrow, next year, next decade, as long as we're transacting. And maybe even beyond then. So until Monday, I want you all to have an excellent, excellent weekend. And thank you very much for listening. I'm going to go ahead and close this out with Meshuggah Bleed here on Coin Metal.